be thinking about encouragement this morning. And uh, there's some things I have given up on. <clears throat> so I thought I'd share that with you while we're talking about encouragement. First of all, the Rubik's Cube. <laughs> you know, uh, I tried it and tried it, and uh, I just can't get it to work right for me. I think somewhere there's uh, some trick that uh, I've never caught on to. And I saw this guy on TV do it in, what was that, eight seconds? And then he could do it with his eyes closed. I can't even do it with my eyes open and somebody giving me instructions on it. So I give up. Now, <clears throat> uh, another thing that I've got that was given to me is a perplexus. How many of you have ever tried to do one of those? It's a globe. I meant to bring it so you could see it. It's a globe, and inside you've got all these pathways, and you've got a little ball bearing that has to go a certain way, and you're supposed to go all the way from the start to the finish. I've made it about halfway, and there's one place that I just try and try and try, and the marble always falls off, you know. Haven't quite given up on it, but almost. Crossword puzzles. I tried and tried, and I finally just said, you know, they talk a different language than I do. I, I can't figure them out. Well, what have you given up on? You know, there's a lot of things in our life that when they come up, we get a little discouraged, and, and it's easy to give up. And as I thought about all this going on in our church, I thought this is a good time to talk about encouragement and, and helping our members here not to give up, not to lose heart. So, do you need encouragement? How many of you need encouragement in some way? Oh, okay, good. Uh, <clears throat> i tell you what let's do for just a second here. Turn to somebody right beside you and say, I want to encourage you. Go ahead. Okay, we'll do more of this maybe here. Now... <clears throat> You know, every problem has a solution. And there's problems with solutions. You see, the solution sometimes becomes a new problem. Every problem has a solution, and every solution has a problem. And that's because uh, there's few really simple solutions. Uh, after the tragic events that have been taking place, I heard one person say, well, what we should do is just this. Well, you know, it sounded good when he said it, and then I thought, wait, that's just a simple solution. It ignores hundreds of other factors there. And so there's few simple solutions. If, if there's a simple solution, somebody would have already thought about it and done it. So there's few simple solutions. And <clears throat> we work in a system. And a system means that everything works together, comes together like gears do, you know. And in that system, it's easy to change one thing, but when one thing changes, everything changes. And so you have a, a different relationship, a different action there. As uh, one changes, you begin to adapt on it. Um, hundreds of illustrations that you can think of yourself, I'm sure, of how that uh, one little thing, you know, made a difference, but it made a whole change in your life there. So we were dealing with systems, and then sometimes we say, well, I don't want to do anything till I get all the facts. And, you know, we never get all the facts. Uh, we get part of them, but somewhere there's always more fact and more factors out there than what we have, you know. So, in thinking about this, I thought how much our church is in a change 
process right now. I think what got me started thinking about this was when we had Pastor David here in view of a call, and he began to say, well, you know, here's some things I'd like to change. And then we thought, yeah, okay, that sounds good. We can make changes. But he got us all thinking about what we really want to do. And you probably have noticed that there's been some changes in our worship service uh, in the past couple of months because we begin to say there are changes that we want. And so we begin to make these changes, not depending on the pastor. We haven't had a pastor for 18 months, and it's easy to say, well, what should we be doing? Let's just coast along. But we haven't coasted, and I don't think we intend to coast because we, we're in a change process. Another part of this change process is that our membership has changed. We've had uh, some of our key leaders move to the mainland. We've given up some of our key leaders to a new church start. And uh, <clears throat> we've had others that just, God led them somewhere else for some other reason. But we've had a change in membership. So who are we now? What are we really like? And so we're in this change process. And then uh, in spite of all this other going on, I had to put in here that we're more active. Now, you probably say, you know, how could we have been more active than what we were? But you look at what we've been doing. We've had one block party, about to have another block party. In the past uh, 18 months, we've had two vacation Bible schools. We've started reaching children that we weren't reaching before. Uh, <clears throat> we've had activities that uh, we've never tried before. So, so we're actually more active. Now, if you ask the church council about it, they've gone from meeting once a month to meeting twice a month. And there for a while, we're meeting every week because we have become more active. And you've been more involved in all of these activities. So we're in a change process. Now, what does change bring? You know, when you look at change, do you see a glass that's full or do you see a glass that's empty? Or do you see a glass that's twice as big as what you really need? Uh, you know, we can look at this change that's taken place. And is it an encouragement for us? Or is it a discouragement? Can we get excited about the change or we say, oh no, another change? Well, I hope that it's encouragement to us. But to make it that, we have to encourage each other. It has to be more than just pastor up here encouraging you, you know, you should do better, so do better. Uh, <clears throat> it should be us encouraging each other. Say you're doing a good job. You know, where can I fit in? How can I help? Uh, we've got a lot to do, you know. So encourage one another. And I, thinking about this, I thought, how can we encourage each other? And I started trying to find a scripture just on encouragement. And then I thought, well, wait just a minute. There's one that probably hasn't been used in encouragement, but I think it would fit in. That's Galatians, the sixth chapter. And <clears throat> starting with the first verse there. Brothers and sisters, if anyone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you may also be tempted. Here, Paul is saying, when somebody fails, when somebody uh, is not able to do what they were trying to do or gets caught in some sin that we need to restore them gently. Uh, you know that I, I said once, I'm, once I was a D.O.M. I've always been a D.O.M. 
Um, I've, it's been 10 years since I was DOM, and yet I get calls, and people will say, and, you know, in our church, this is happening, and, and can something be done about it? And here's a, a person that's a problem. What should we do? And, you know, I, I come back to this, that there has to be this gentle restoration that we have people that, that we've had problems with. We have people that have sinned. We have people that some people just plain offensive, you know. And we need to restore them gently. Not reject them, not leave them out, but restore them. And so Paul says that we need to be careful and watch ourselves in the process. Because it's easy. Easy, first of all, to fall into the same sin. Uh, a person talking to me one time was talking about uh, somebody else. Now, the person talking to me, you'd have to understand that in our 30 minutes of conversation, he had never talked about anybody else. The whole subject had been him. And uh, as we talked there, I decided to mention somebody else. And I said, oh, yeah, you, you know so-and-so. He said, oh, yeah, he's the most egotistical person I've ever met. <laughs> you know, I, I sat there for a minute and thought, I don't have any reply to this. You know? <clears throat> you know, we can fall into the same sin that we're criticizing. We can fall into the same guilt and do it unconsciously. And so Paul is saying, watch yourself. And then another part of that watching yourself is not falling into the same, but going to the opposite extreme. That we, you know, uh, we, we don't want to do that, so we go to the other extreme, and we're not tolerant, we're not patient, we're not gentle because we've taken this extreme position. I think, you know, there's part of the reason our political system is so messed up. You know, we're, we're dealing with extremes instead of the center where most people live. But for us as Christians, we need to be watching ourselves that we don't go to an extreme, that that extreme is not there to reject people, but rather to bring people together, to restore gently. The next verse. Paul says, carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. I like that. That he's saying, carry one another, carry one another's burdens. You see, we're a team. This uh, past week, I was... I, flipped on a channel there and they were having some one of these obstacle courses the team has to do such and such and everybody's trying to win trying to be the first one there and then one team as uh, they were hanging from something they were supposed to drop off of it they dropped off and one lady you could see as she hit the ground she turned her ankle and she fell down and <clears throat> You know, I had my thought when I saw that was, oops, <laughs> it's going to take that team out. But the leader of the team, who had already ahead of her, heard her say some cry out or whatever, and he turned around and ran back to her and didn't ask her, how bad are you, how hurt are you? He picked her up and pitched her over his shoulder and took off running. And I thought, that's a team. If I were going to be on a team, that's the one I'd want to be on, you know. That when something happens, the team is there. And all the way through, as they climbed over whatever else, they were helping her because she couldn't do it all with the sprained ankle. But they were there to help her, to carry her. And so we're teams, but we, that means we bear one another's burdens. Now, sometimes we can even get credit for what somebody else is doing, and that's okay. I liked the story, and I, I may have changed part of it. I can't remember exactly, but I think as Michael Jordan 
that had had such a spectacular night that he had made 32 points. And right at the last of the, the game, the coach put in a person that hadn't played much. And this person came in and made a shot and made two points there. And for some reason in the interview, they were interviewing the person that came in at the last minute. And they said, well, what do you think about this game? He said, oh, to me, it's a highlight of my career where Michael Jordan and I teamed up for 34 points. <laughs> well, <clears throat> you know, we can give credit. We can accept what others are doing because we're a team. And as we come together at church, we're a team there that we're working together and we pick up the load from one another so that we're working together. And then he gives the reason for this is because if we do this, we're fulfilling the law of Christ. Now, what is the law of Christ? Jesus gave only one command. He said, a new man, a new command I give to you. Love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. That's the command. That's pure and simple. I heard a rather famous preacher sharing with a bunch of us pastors one time that uh, <clears throat> he decided to just do something different one Sunday morning. And... It came time for him to preach, and he walked up to the platform, and he said, love one another. And he walked over and sat down. And everybody looked at each other, what's supposed to happen now? And the music director, you know, looked, praise team leaders, looked over, well, am I supposed to be doing something, you know? And the person that had been uh, making announcements looked, did we have an announcement, you know? What is it? And after four or five minutes of silence and everybody looking at each other, this famous preacher came back to the platform, to the pulpit, and he said, the message today is love one another. And he went over and sat down again. Everybody began to look, you know, what is this? What's happening here? And after four or five minutes, he walks back up there. Now, he said that I knew I needed to do something more than what I'd been doing. And he said, the message today is love one another. And when he said that, instead of sitting up here where he usually did, he walked down and sat down on the first row there. And he sat there, not saying anything. He said it was quiet. You could hear a pin drop in the whole auditorium. And the fellow that he had sat next to sat there for a minute and he looked at him and he said, Oh, I get it. We really are supposed to love each other. And he said when that happened, conversations broke out all over the auditorium. And he saw people walk over and hug each other and people talk to each other. And he said, they really did get it, that we are supposed to love one another. That's the command of Jesus. Again, how do we do this? How do we encourage each other? In the third verse, he said, if anyone thinks you're something when they are not, they deceive themselves. Everyone should test their, action, their own actions then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. For each one should bear his own load. What a contrast. He says, carry one another's burdens. And then he says, bear your own burden. Is there a conflict there? No. Because what we're doing is... We're picking up the load of others, but we're not dumping on them. We're not saying, here, you have to take mine, you know. Uh, <clears throat> we're, we're in humility. We do our part. That we pick up our load and carry our part of it. 
And we don't just stop because somebody else has stopped. We don't give up because somebody else gave up. Instead, we keep doing our part. And as we do our part, we can encourage others because they see us carrying our load. And so we need to carry our load and in humility do it. And, you know, I like this, that he, he says if we really think we're something when we're not, then we just deceive ourselves. That uh, <clears throat> we think we've got it all figured out. Um, fellow talking to me one time uh, he he was uh, trying to convince me what a good person he was and he mentioned one thing he's doing and he said that's the only sin I have and I started to say to him then I need to be letting you counsel me because I have a whole lot more sins than that because it's easy to say oh here's the one problem here's the one thing instead of saying you know, in humility, I want to be servant. Jesus, when he was demonstrated to his disciples what it meant to be a servant, wash their feet, that didn't mean he had taken his load and dumped it on them. He did his part to help them to do their part. So in humility, do your part. And then verse 6. Nevertheless, the one who receives instruction in the Word should share all good things with their instructor. That sounds like Paul just dropped something in here uh, to the church at Galatians saying, you know, you may need to send a little more offering my way. Uh, <clears throat> I don't think that was Paul's intent. But he's saying, you know, if somebody's doing something good, you need to share with them and what good is coming from it and uh, it's share the wealth or actually share the cost in it that we need to work together in such an attitude that when good things come to us it's given out a fellow made a little video of uh, he decided that a, a homeless person would just drink up whatever money is given to him and so as an experiment, he went to this fellow that was there and he gave him, I don't remember what it was, I think it's a hundred dollars, a significant amount. And he then followed this person. They followed this person on camera without him knowing it. And <clears throat> he went into a store that sold liquor and everybody, you know, you figure this is what it's going to be. And he came out with a bag of groceries. And then he went to the area where there were other homeless and he began to give out the groceries that he had bought. And there was not any alcohol in any of that. He was giving out from others that had given to him. And, you know, for us, we've received the grace of God. And we should be sharing that grace with others. And so as good things happen, we're encouraged, and everybody should be encouraged as we share together in it. And then, verse 7. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man sows, uh, reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to, peace, to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to the Spirit, to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Here, Paul is saying you need to keep in a, a spiritual perspective that you don't get locked in on just what is right now and what's happening here in our church, you know, and get discouraged because of that. If we take a spiritual perspective, then we're, it's, it's going to be different. Um, person writing was uh, as I read it was talking about different people that have been great in Christianity and I read these people that I knew and then there was a lady that was mentioned I thought I've never heard of her and so 
I began to try to find out a little bit more about her. And I found out that she had been a missionary in an isolated place in China there. And as a missionary there, she had been able to lead and disciple Watchman Nee and three or four others outstanding Christians. And here, she was hardly ever known as being a great leader in Christianity. But her influence had been felt worldwide. Because she had a spiritual perspective, it would have been easy to say, I'm stuck up here somewhere in China and nobody knows where I am and who I am and what's taking place. But instead, she said, God has a purpose for me. And I'm going to live out that purpose. And in doing that, she has blessed me personally because I've read a lot of Watchmen Nee. And... She has blessed thousands and millions of other people through those that she led to the Lord and discipled. So keep a spiritual perspective. And then Paul said, verse 9, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity... Let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. But very simple, don't give up and quit. Don't stop. We're in the process of changing. It's not a time to quit. It's not a time to, to fall back. It's a time to unite together and say this is where we want to go. And this is what we want to do, and we're going to give ourselves to it. And Paul is saying, God is saying in this scripture, that what is taking place will bring results. It may not bring it next day. It may not bring it tomorrow or this week, but it's going to bring it in due season. And so keep going. Be encouraged. We know there's good results ahead. We can keep working because we know that there's rewards out there of, of being able to do God's will and God's purpose here. Well, why do we need encouragement now in our church? I hope I've given you some good reasons, but I'm going to come back to this. We need it because we're in the process of a new identity. <clears throat> if you ask 24 months ago, what is Cornerstone like? I think you'd get a different answer than if you asked that today. I think you would find out that we have changed our identity some, and I think we'll be changing it some more as we realize what God has called us to do in this place, in this community. And we'll need to know who we are in this process. Many times, and probably most often, the identity of a church is given by the pastor. And so if the pastor is such and such, the church becomes such and such. But that's not the way it always should be because our identity should be from the body here. And we should be able to say, this is why I've united with this body, because I have an identity that God has called me and given to me and fits me in with what's here. And so our identity is not from the pastor, but it's beyond the pastor. And as we look to who we want to call for a pastor, we need to be to know who we are as we look to find a pastor that would fit in with us. The second thing is <clears throat> we're discovering a new mission. Our mission really hasn't changed much. It's to reach our community. But we've tried for a number of years that we've been here to, to reach our neighboring community. And uh, we haven't really been too successful. We've tried a whole bunch of different things, but oh, about a year and a half, well, not that long ago, when we had our first block party, 
and uh, <clears throat> we suddenly reached some of the neighboring kids here, and uh, then we've had more and more of them uh, to attend. So we're, we're reaching children intentionally. Now, to say we're reaching children means that the adults are going to have to put in more effort in it. As I was looking at this week at the uh, names of the kids that are in the Sunday school class, there were eight of those kids that are over 10 years old, 11 years old, I believe. Now, they shouldn't be in a class with four and five-year-olds. It just doesn't work out. But we don't have a teacher. We don't have anyone saying, I'll teach that class, and we could start it. We could find a place for it. Because our mission is changing to a certain extent. We're still trying to reach the community. Now then we're saying, God has given us some some kids, and we need to be responsible for these. And then we're developing a new vision. We're beginning to see things a little differently. Uh, <clears throat> what, what will we be like five years from now? What do you see for Cornerstone five years from now? Uh, we're doing some study on the plot plan here, uh, figuring out how we can best use the site. We're talking about uh, adding buildings and stuff, and, <clears throat> and it's going to be different five years from now because I think the greatest time is ahead of us. I think God has been opening some doors for us that, that we've been praying about for years. And I think if those open doors are going to make a difference for what we do and what we will be like five years from now. I think it, it's exciting to think about it. It'd be fun just to take time here and, and let you talk with each other for a few minutes about what I'd like to see five years from now. Uh, do it during fellowship time there. What do we want to be five years from now? We need encouragement now. We have the same mandate from God that He has always given to live it out, to live out what we know in Jesus Christ, to live it out <clears throat> so that the world can see it and we can be His witnesses. That hasn't changed. And we need to take that mandate from God to love one another to be His witnesses and to reach out in this community. As we bow for our time of prayer, this is your time for prayer and decision. As we bow in prayer, ask God to, to speak to you and, and ask Him to show you what your part is in this. Ask Him to show you who you can encourage this week, or what encouragement you need so that you'll be encouraged. Ask Him to help you see what the church should be in the days ahead. Our Father, we are living in a time of, of change for our church. And we ask, Lord, that you direct this change that we will encourage each other in the change. That we will not get discouraged and give up, but that we'll continue knowing that there is a result out there that you have for us. So Lord, we make a new commitment to you today to be a part of the team, to be able to encourage each other to pick up the load and to carry on load and to love one another. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.